Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming along today. Um, today, as Russell said, I'm pretty much going to be giving a bit of an overview of um, some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years into Commonwealth fraud, particularly into serious Commonwealth fraud. And this work has been um, part of my PhD thesis. So about half the PhD thesis was um, dealing with Commonwealth fraud and the other half was dealing with performance measurement and performance monitoring. So often one of the first issues that I need to address when I start to talk to someone or a group of people about Commonwealth fraud is why on earth we would be interested in that. Now hopefully given the background of a lot of the people here, that's probably going to be preaching to the choir, but just in case you've been dragged along anyway and it wasn't necessarily your idea. Um, Fraud is really one of those areas which has a tendency to be um, neglected in a lot of ways by both academic criminology and also by the media. Um, Michael Levy, who is one of the UK's top researchers in fraud, has complained about this for years. And one of the things that he says is that, well, fraud's not a particularly sexy crime. It doesn't really grab the attention of the public in the same way that street crime does. It's not conceived of as a signal crime, so it's not the kind of crime that makes people think something's going wrong in my city or in my neighbourhood. And it's also not the kind of crime that people conceptualise when they think about what the core crime problem is. And it's not just the public here, but that's a, a political um, stance as well, in that fraud in many instances is, an, is really seen as sort of an other kind of crime. And in a sense, part of that's what I'm going to talk about today. But we really should give a damn about fraud, mostly, if nothing else, because it's an incredibly costly crime. So the cost of fraud to Australia, so fraud in general in Australia, is actually higher than any other crime. It's higher than the cost of drug crimes, violent crimes. If you look at the economic cost of crime, in 2005 it was calculated at um, the fraud component alone, $8.5 billion in that year, which is enormous. It's almost a quarter of the total cost of all of the crime in Australia, and it, um, it, the cost is higher than the cost of maintaining the entire police services in Australia. But it's not only interesting because it's expensive, it's also a very interesting crime theoretically. So there's a couple of reasons for this. Fraud's been conceptualised uh, as the kind of crime that the average person can find themselves committing, that you could maybe slip into. There's a slippery slope argument often framed around fraud. And it's been theorised as the kind of crime that you don't need to see yourself as being a criminal in order to actually commit that kind of crime. So it's quite interesting in that manner, in that it's an everyday kind of thing. It's also interesting in sort of a theoretical framework because of the fact that it's a, fr it's a crime that in a sense seems to attract a higher level of participation from women. Now generally speaking, crime is committed by men. It's a, a blanket statement, but it holds true pretty much across the board. In Australia, if you look at who's in prison, 7% of the people in prison are women um, across the board. But if you look at who's in prison for crimes of deception, you get 21% of those people are women. And so apart from prostitution, it's the crime that women are most likely to hold a significant share of. So that's interesting in itself. What does this tell us about gender and crime when we look at fraud? Um, and the final reason that it's uh, particularly interesting and particularly interesting to me is that fraud is the kind of crime that you can use to look at one of the, uh, the big theoretical questions within criminology, which is about the division between white collar crime and street crime and whether or not that's a real distinction that we ought to in fact be making. So I'll just go over a little bit about how fraud gets treated by criminology or by academic criminology. Now when I say that it's neglected, we're very fortunate in the AIC that this is an area that actually takes a lot of focus from the AIC's resources, which is fantastic. But generally speaking, as I said, it's not the kind of crime that gets a whole heap of attention. Fraud usually gets examined when it is looked at by criminology in one of either two frameworks. So there's a small body of research that looks into uh, welfare fraud and looks at that from a social justice perspective and that kind of work overlaps within the sort of criminology and uh, social work kind of frameworks. But there's the majority of the little work that gets done tends to see fraud as a white collar crime. So when we think about white collar crime this is a term that was um, was coined back in 1939. So Edwin Sutherland, who's a, a great sociologist at the time, brought about this term 
to try to dispel the idea that there was a class distinction in who was responsible for crime. The whole idea was that, the, that crime isn't all just down to the dangerous classes, people with low socioeconomic status, but people with high socioeconomic status were committing crime too. And this got termed white collar crime. Now, not rich people stabbing their wives, that wasn't white collar crime. The way that he conceptualised it was um, people, crimes committed by persons of respectability and high social status within the course of their employment. So there's this particular kind of crime that was set up as white collar crime. Unfortunately, we've ended up with some pretty muddy definitions or um, a number of definitional streams over time. Sutherland's actual work where he looked at white collar crime in detail didn't actually refer to very much to crimes of individuals, but actually is more what we consider to be corporate crime. So white collar crime gets split and we end up with corporate crime on one hand and we end up with occupational crime committed by people of high occupational status on another hand. Fraud tends to get looked at as though it's that occupational um, crime by people in high social status. Now, when we look at this little body of research that does look around fraud, we do tend to see that fraud is conceptualised as white collar crime and then what we end up seeing is that the typical fraud offender is a middle aged, middle class man, he's got um, decent occupational prestige. So someone in their 40s, usually male as most criminals are, uh, and this is what we see when we look at the typical fraudster. Now it's been argued that the reason that we see middle-aged men in occupational uh, prestige, uh, positions of occupational prestige as the typical fraudster is because fraud is a crime that happens within the course of your occupation and it takes you years to develop that kind of trust where you've got the opportunities to commit fraud within the environment that you work in. And so that's why it tends to come with age and it's also presumably why it tends to come with being male is because those opportunities of being at the top where you've got responsibility and um, less accountability necessarily uh, tend to come with those particular characteristics. So that's why we see middle-aged men being the typical fraudster or so a lot of the research tells us. I'm going to be arguing against that idea today. I'd also like to argue that the reason that we see that is our typical fraudster is because of the way that we conceptualise fraud. So because we're seeing it as white collar crime um, and that we've divided our samples up in a particular way, that's why we'll see the kind of frauds that we see. Now that's not to say that there's no such thing as fraud that is white collar crime. There are plenty of frauds which are committed in part of your occupation. There's corporate fraud, there's uh, fraud committed by people from a high occupational status. But I'd argue that there are so many other frauds that are committed by people who don't have those characteristics. So you have welfare fraud for instance. Welfare fraud is just as fraudulent as tax fraud and yet by no means would you consider that that's something that requires a high occupational status. So I think that there's been a bit of a confounding of this idea of white collar crime and fraud. Um, so if we end up defining fraud this way, I think that to a certain extent we can end up perpetuating this idea that there is crime by class. And um, so that's one of the unfortunate uh, end points I think of Sutherland's work. All right, so if that's what fraud isn't, which was a big ramble about what fraud isn't, what is fraud? Well, fraud, according to a nice, succinct definition that comes out of the Commonwealth Fraud Control Guidelines, dishonestly obtaining a benefit by deception or other means. So it's a nice, simple thing, really. Fraud is simply a crime of deception. So that can be anything from welfare fraud to romance fraud, uh, high value tax fraud, embezzlement, Nigerian money laundering, you name it, if there's deception and that's the key element, that's all what fraud is. So essentially we're looking at a fraudster is deceiving the victim into effectively voluntarily giving up something of value. So it's quite an interesting crime in the way that that's conducted um, compared to a lot of different crimes, other different crimes. So that's what fraud is in general. My research has looked specifically at Commonwealth fraud. And specifically within that section, frauds which are committed against Commonwealth government agencies, but that are considered serious enough to have been investigated by the Australian Federal Police. So that's the, the particular niche that I've got an interest in. I've also been very lucky that my PhD research was funded by the AFP or supported by the AFP, and I got an immense amount of access to data. So 
um, having seven years worth of data from 2000 to 2007 of all of the cases which were referred to the AFP. I've been very fortunate. The rest of the seminar is basically going to look a little something like this. Firstly, I'll talk a little bit about Commonwealth fraud in general, and then I'll talk about the AFP's role in investigating fraud. But then I'll talk through three different studies that I conducted as part of my PhD. So the first study looks at, is there actually a difference between people who commit fraud against Commonwealth um, agencies, so serious fraud, compared to people who commit serious fraud against other victim types, so businesses and individuals predominantly. So that's study one. Study two looks at a typology of uh, Commonwealth fraud suspects. So the idea here is, can we find subgroups? Is there diversity and variation within the people who are suspected of committing fraud? Or is sort of looking at the average person simply enough? So that's study two. And study three, I'll only talk about this one really briefly and only a small section of it. And that one looks at factors which predict the conviction of people in cases of serious fraud if the case has already gone through prosecution. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, I'll try to tie all of that back in, have a look at what the key findings are overall, and then relate that back to what impact this can have or this understanding of fraud at this level might have for theoretical criminology. Okay, so Commonwealth fraud. We know that fraud is a big problem in, um, in Australia. I've said before that it's eight and a half billion dollars in one year. It's also been estimated that about 13% of that fraud is uh, fraud committed against Australian Commonwealth government agencies. That's one estimate at least. So we know that Commonwealth fraud actually takes up a fair amount of Australia's resources in both dealing with it but also the ramifications of it. 39% of all Commonwealth agencies um, that had to report about fraud under the Fraud Control Guidelines said that they were the victim of fraud in the year 2008-2009. So it's also really, really widespread within the Commonwealth. There are some agencies which detect a lot more fraud than others, and clearly there are some agencies that detect none. And as well, there's going to be a dark figure of fraud. This is what's been detected, but what's been detected is really quite huge. There were 800,000 incidents, or over 800,000 incidents, which were detected. And that's an enormous amount. Primarily, these frauds are committed, or at least the detected frauds, are committed by people who are external to the agency itself. So people who may be a client of uh, Centrelink, or people who are lodging false tax returns, or um, false customs and excise claims, something along those lines. Only a very small, less than half a percent of those frauds, for Commonwealth fraud in general, were deemed to have been internal frauds. It's still a large number, but in terms of proportion, it's really quite small. Um, now that's Commonwealth fraud as a whole. The piece that I'm interested in is the serious Commonwealth fraud, and the stuff that's serious enough to get the AFP involved. So in that same financial year where there were over 800,000 incidences, only a very small percentage are considered serious enough to go to the AFP. So we ended up with 415 cases in that particular year, and they ended up, um, the AFP only accepted 368 of those cases. It's still got a pretty high value, however, because what's being referred tends to be the most serious stuff. So, the AFP is considered to be the Commonwealth's primary law enforcement agency. One of the key priorities, which is passed down from the Minister to the AFP, is to safeguard Australia's economic interests by investigating cases of fraud against Commonwealth agencies. Now, the AFP doesn't deal with state um, crimes, only with the Commonwealth crimes. Under the Commonwealth Fraud Control Guidelines, which first came in in 2002, although there were other uh, similar kinds of versions beforehand, all of the Commonwealth agencies are required to report their, um, their fraud and they're required also to have, um, <coughs> excuse me, they're required to have um, provisions in place to detect fraud and deter fraud. They're also required in general to investigate their own fraud. If there is fraud which is minor or fraud which is considered routine, that kind of stuff gets investigated by the agency that was defrauded on the whole. It's only the serious or complex economic fraud which goes up to the federal police to be investigated. And, and under certain circumstances, the agency can deal with it themselves, but generally speaking, it's the serious and complex stuff. <coughs> 
In terms of what makes fraud um, serious or complex, it's not a, a mathematical formula, it's not as simple as saying must be over a value of X. There's a lot of complexity and uh, these judgment calls are made <laughs> using a case categorization and prioritization model that the AFP uses and that then helps them determine whether or not the case is considered serious or complex enough to be examined by them. So it does take into account the significance of the financial loss, so it takes into account money, but it's more than that. It's also the damage to the security or well-being of Australia. If there's a serious breach of trust by a Commonwealth employee or if there's bribery or corruption of a Commonwealth employee, that makes it serious. Um, anything that, uh, fraud that uses sophisticated technology or um, criminal conspiracies, frauds which go across multiple agencies, any activities which might be considered to affect wider law enforcement, so it's important to keep them under control, um, and if there's the possibility of um, taking action under the Proceeds of Crime Act, uh, as well as conflict of interest or political sensitivity. So all of these factors get taken into account when you're deciding whether or not the fraud is serious enough to refer up to the AFP. So a couple of examples, and these are just ones which are publicly released um, through the AFP annual reports or through their media releases. So we have one example where a 24-year-old woman was charged with identity crime and migration fraud. Uh, she'd made, um, or she was accused of making fake documents that would allow international students to be eligible where they weren't realistic, um, accurately eligible for skilled migration programs. There was a year-long investigation by the AFP and other agencies. If she was convicted, uh, it would have been up to 10 years in prison or a $110,000 fine. So it's the kind of crime which has some pretty serious penalties attached to it. Operation Havanese was a case which took five years of a joint investigation across multiple agencies um, and the AFP. In this particular instance, there were two duty-free stores in Brisbane um, that both um, claimed to have sold tobacco onto uh, ships' crews and claimed that the tobacco had been exported so that therefore they didn't have to pay any excise on it. $13 million worth of tobacco and excise fraud. Um, that was a really nice sum of money. Unfortunately for them, they also got convicted and ended up having over $15 million of um, proceeds of crime restrained. So those 11 people were convicted for that one uh, case. And the last example up here is Project Wickenby, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of. And that was a very large joint investigation set up in 2006. And the idea here was to look at tax avoidance um, and large-scale money laundering that we're using offshore structures and offshore transactions. So they were looking at really high-risk taxpayers. In one year alone, uh, there were 54 search warrants issued up until the 2009-2010 uh, reporting schedule, which is where I have this from. There were 44 people had been charged and four people had been convicted and imprisoned. So basically, these are pretty top-end kind of cases that the AFP deals with. They're not necessarily representative of all of the cases, um, but certainly you can see that at, at one end of the scale, there are some pretty expansive frauds to be looked at. This, I've been told, is a terribly simplified version of what actually happens when you take a case and try to refer it through the Commonwealth um, prosecution system. So basically, if you have a uh, fraud that's been identified and detected, then the agency gets to choose whether or not it refers it to the federal police. So as I've said, they've got to look at this whole case categorisation and prioritisation model, and the agency also has, can confer with the AFP about whether or not this is a case which is likely to go up. So they can refer it to the AFP or they can choose not to for a number of reasons. It may not be serious enough or it may not have enough evidence that it might warrant the attention of the AFP as yet. So in that case it can go back to the agency. The agency can then do a number of things with the case. They can send for further investigation, try to find new evidence. They could deal with it just under administrative sanctions, so fines. Um, or penalties <coughs> that they can impose themselves without needing to involve the criminal justice system. Or they can refer the, um, the case through to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions who can then um, take it to court on the agency's behalf. And that happens quite widely for the routine and minor cases. If, however, they decide to refer it to the AFP because it's not routine and minor, 
then the AFP gets to decide whether or not to take it on. And again, at any point, they can send it back to the agency. Um, if it's accepted, then they, the AFP investigates, then consults with the uh, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions as to whether or not they should prosecute. And if it's prosecuted, then it comes down to whether or not it's convicted. So as I said, a reasonably simplistic version of a very complex model in real life. So these are uh, quick details of the samples that I'm using in the modelling that I've done within these studies. So as I said before, I've got seven years worth of data from the AFP. What I've ended up with is um, a full sample, which is 852 cases. Now these were cases which were referred, but not all of them are going to have been accepted. Uh, about 250 of them got sent back to the agencies and not all of them were finalised. For the cases which were accepted, um, there were suspect details for the, a rather large number of them. Not all of the cases had suspect details because they tend to get added in a little bit. The longer the case is in the system, the more likely there is to be increased detail. So that's the full sample. For the first study where I'm looking at whether or not our, I call them our offenders, I probably shouldn't, I don't know any of them personally as far as I'm aware, the Commonwealth fraud offenders, comparing them to other Australian serious fraud offenders. For that study I have 267 offenders who were convicted in 177 cases. So as you can see you can have multiple offenders on a particular case. The next study down looks at suspects and this is looking at a cluster analysis of suspects to create that typology that I talked about briefly. For that I've got 479 suspects, so nearly 500 people across 300 cases and we can use that to see whether or not there's groupings. And finally to look at the outcomes of fraud investigations, there are 249 cases which were accepted and finalised and had been prosecuted. Of those cases, two-thirds of them ended up getting a conviction attached to them and one-third didn't. Okay, now I'm moving on to study one. It's deceptive when I have a number one next to something else. So this uh, particular study is looking at whether or not Commonwealth fraudsters are different from other fraudsters. So what we know overall about fraud offenders. As I mentioned earlier, most of the research into fraud looks within the framework of white collar crime. So it tends to be interested in the crimes of the elite. One of the problems with this is that if you tend to be focused on the crimes of elite, the elite, you can't necessarily generalise out to talk about fraud as a whole. Now obviously I can't generalise out to talk about fraud as a whole, I can talk about serious fraud. But I think it is an issue within criminology in the academic framework that um, fraud is considered to be this kind of crime. So the literature frequently puts um, frauds as in, in contrast, they define them in contrast to other kinds of offenders. So what we see is the contrast between the typical fraud offender and the typical street offender. Fraud offenders do tend to be older on average than the typical street offender, so people in prison in general are about average age of 33, whereas people who are there for deception are about 10 years older and most um, empirical work will bear that out, that people who commit fraud definitely seem to be older on the whole. Uh, and again, while the majority of them are male, there's still that very high proportion of women um, committing fraud. Now while some of the literature positions fraud as an occupational crime, I'd argue that uh, the opportunity structures which are set up by the relationships that you have with your victim is what's going to largely dictate the kinds of crime that you can commit. And that these opportunities which are available to people who have regular contact with the Commonwealth, um, be you, you know, some, one of the millions of people who has regular contact with Centrelink through family tax benefits, through welfare of one variety or another or through pensions, or whether it's through your regular contact with the tax department, each of these agencies is going to offer up different opportunities to different kinds of people. <coughs> so the key question I'm interested in for this particular study is whether or not fraud offenders vary according to who is their victim. So if different victim types give up different opportunities, will we see different kinds of people committing crimes against different victims, basically? So will we see differences between those who commit serious fraud against the Commonwealth compared to those who commit serious fraud against businesses or individuals. 
Okay, so to do this, I took the sample that I had and compared it to the published results from two studies of serious fraud offenders in Australia. The first study was by Russell, uh, by the AIC in 2003, which is a very major study. It looked at 155 fraud cases, 208 accused people, 88% of whom were uh, convicted um, across Australia and New Zealand in 98 and 99. Now, there's a couple of issues that um, I have in limitations with comparing my fraudsters, as I'd like to call them, with this particular sample. One of which is that in this sample, not everyone's been convicted. So that is an issue, and I'm happy to discuss the implications of that later. Um, the other issue is that there are about 12.8% of those cases were against the Commonwealth. So there are issues there that the estimates may in fact be in reality further apart than the numbers that I get are able to show. But I'm happy to discuss that in detail. So the kinds of cases, uh, the selection mechanism for the cases uh, as a pretty sort of broad brush stroke was that there had to be either a financial loss generally in excess of $100,000 or there had to be sophisticated planning or there had to be professionals in breach of client financial trust. So in to a certain extent, there's a fair amount of overlap between that definition of, of serious fraud and the way that the AFP would categorise serious fraud. The victims, as I said, included businesses, the general public, um, and also public sector agencies. The second study that I compared my people to is one by Maria Crambia Capatis, and I hope that I've pronounced that properly, uh, who published in 2001. She had 50 cases of major fraud which were um, which were finalised in the state of Victoria. And for those particular cases, they all came out, police prosecution files, what was used for the evidence, um, and it was major fraud cases where the offender did hold a position of financial trust and the entire um, appeals process had been finalised and the case had been tried between 1990 and 1994. So one of the other issues is that the date range is slightly apart for my fraudsters and these guys. But still, given that these are the two big samples that are available, it's worth having a look to see whether or not Commonwealth fraudsters are different from other serious fraudsters. The variables that I used to assess were the kinds of variables that you see in a lot of the fraud literature. Firstly, whether or not the person who was convicted was a, uh, had a white collar profession. And we've defined that as being a manager or being a professional. The age that the person was at the date that the case was reported, so that's as close as we can get to when they were committing the crime, in my sample at least. The sex of the offender. There was some um, extra work done on the AIC sample by Janice Goldstra White around um, gender. So one of the other things that I've put in there is whether or not women work with men, um, because there seems to be a, a case that, uh, an argument that that is often the case. Whether or not the offender was a sole offender or if they worked with other people was another variable of interest and the financial value of the fraud because obviously that's a pretty important factor. So the results of study one, and I've saved you all from a horrible table, uh, is basically we've got some similarities but we've got some differences. So the results of the comparison show that um, in all of the samples, the average age was pretty much the same, 42 years old, 43 years old. There's no significant difference across these samples in age. We see the same average age uh, committing fraud regardless of where uh, they're committing it for serious fraud. Um, what we also see is that, um, <clears throat> is that in all of these samples, the offenders were much more likely to work alone than they were to work with other people. Fraud is generally conceptualised as a solitary crime and none of the evidence out of these samples shows anything other than that. At least 80% of people on average tend to work by themselves. There are though some, some key differences among the samples. Commonwealth fraud offenders were much, much less likely to hold a white collar occupation. Uh, only 24% of the uh, Commonwealth fraud sample, the serious fraudsters here, were, had a managerial or professional occupation listed against them. And that's quite different from, well in the Cranby Capata sample, pretty much 100% were people in a, f a position of financial professional responsibility. And in the AIC sample it was closer to about 61%. So there's quite a big difference in how white collar your fraudsters are across 
who the victim is. We also see that in the Commonwealth fraud situation, women are much more highly represented. So we've got 31% of serious Commonwealth fraud offenders were female, and that's much higher than in both of those other samples. But they also tend to defraud much lower values. Um, the mean is $370,000 for a, a serious Commonwealth fraud, which doesn't sound like it's a small amount of money until you're comparing it to the $4.4 million average for the Cranberry Capata sample and I believe $1.6 million for the AIC sample. So our guys are not such high flyers as, um, as what we see in the samples where people are committing fraud against businesses and individuals. Part of that may be due to uh, the choice of victim and part of that may be due to the definitional differences, particularly the differences between the cranberry Capata sample, which is very much a white collar version of fraud, and the serious Commonwealth fraud offenders. But the things that we do see is that Commonwealth fraud seems to be easier for women to participate in, and Commonwealth fraud seems to really not have those occupational barriers that theoretical criminology tells us should be there for serious fraud. Okay, second uh, study, number three, is looking at a typology of Commonwealth fraud suspects. So Commonwealth um, fraud offenders, um, we know that they're not necessarily as much of a high flyer. They don't really fit that same picture of the elite white collar criminal that often gets described in the literature. And that's what we see out of the previous study. But that's just when we look at the average person. And sometimes looking at the average person is not the best way of going about looking at your data. There's an enormous amount of variability and looking at more closely at that variability can be quite helpful. So that's what this next question is really looking at, whether or not the average gives us the entire picture. There's a big tradition within <coughs> criminology literature of looking at the psychological profiles and making subtypes of people according to the motivation that leads them to crime or the psychological characteristics that might group people differently. So those kind of typologies are well established in crim. The kind of typology that I'm interested in though was to see whether or not those sociodemographic characteristics that we typically use to describe fraudsters also have subtypes. So Rather than looking at the inside of someone's head and trying to figure out if there's subtypes based on something I can't see, I'm interested in are there subtypes based on things that I can see. So for that, I'm looking at using, I've used uh, cluster analysis to explore this variability and diversity in the population of serious fraud suspects. Um, one of the reasons for that is that um, I was working in conjunction with the AFP and we're interested to see if of all the people that are where the cases are accepted and they become a suspect, is there, are there groupings within those people? Again, really similar kinds of variables. We're looking at is the person white collar uh, occupation? What's their age group in um, just general categories of, of tens, basically? So we're looking at decades in their 20s, in their 30s, 40s, etc. Again, whether they're female, whether they work with other people, uh, if they work just by themselves with one other person or in a larger group. And if they do work in a larger group, what kind of gender mix do we see in that group? Because that seems to also differentiate people, or at least the way that their crimes are committed. And once again, the dollar value. Only the dollar values are huge, so they've been logged. Okay, so as I said, I've used cluster analysis to do this particular exercise. Cluster analysis is an exploratory statistical technique and the idea is that you find subgroups or clusters within the data. So these clusters are the, the subsets where if I'm in a cluster, I've got more in common with the other people in that cluster with me than I have with people in another cluster. And so that's basically the, the gist of the exercise, is that looking at all of the individuals, and you can see from this um, chart on the left, each of these little tiny points down the bottom is each individual. How closely do they group to other individuals to make little clusters? And then how closely do those little clusters join together to make bigger clusters? And it's a hierarchical system, and it basically builds a tree upwards. So on the left, what we've got is a dendrogram of the top 100 clusters, because if I went down to 400, it, you can't see anything. On the right is the dendrogram or the tree di diagram 
of the top eight clusters. So this is the, uh, what I've ended up with, is eight statistically distinct clusters, whereby the people inside those clusters are much more in common with each other than with people in different clusters based on those grouping variables. Now, this was probably, as charts go, it looks nice and simple, but was possibly the bane of my life for quite some time. If I've got six variables and I've got two dimensions on a graph, that doesn't come out to be easy. So what I've done is um, tried to use different tactics so that we can see it. On the left-hand side, on the vertical axis, that's the dollar value of the crime. So I said that it was presented on a log uh, scale because otherwise this is a very, very enormous, there's a lot of outlying kind of uh, very high value frauds. But you can see we've got a number there of how much that translates to in thousands for easy reference. So cluster one has an average of $6,000 fraud, whereas cluster seven, the guy right up the top, is over uh, $9 million worth of fraud. <coughs> so there's quite a lot of variability there. Uh, the horizontal axis, moving from left to right, we've got the average age of the suspect. For each of the points on the graph, what they are is the average of each of the clusters. So I haven't put every single individual in there, but I've picked the average individual for each of those groups. The colour of the marker bubbles is used to show the gender distinctions. So blue is more than 75% male, um, green is 50 to 75% male, and the one lone little pink cluster has got less than 50% male and is virtually, I believe, 100% female. So one of the things that we can see is that as the dollar value gets higher, uh, the gender becomes much more likely to be male. So, which is not a terribly surprising kind of finding when you consider what we do know about uh, fraud in general. Now, next to each of those bubbles tells us what the cluster's name is, what percentage WC, it's not to do with toilets, it's white colour. So 7% WC in um, cluster 6 means that only 7% of those people in that cluster had a white collar occupation. And again, we see that as we get to the really high values up on the right, those are much more likely to have people with a white collar occupation. So there's a bit of a pattern emerging. And finally in the brackets, we'll see what the sample size, well not the sample size rather, the number of people in that cluster. So little green cluster on our left, cluster six, has got 55 people in it. Big cluster up on the right is 72 people. And finally, the size of the dot of the bubble itself is in proportion to the number of people who on average in that cluster work together. So the clusters down in the middle here, these guys, on average, one, one and a half people. So there's, they're people working pre uh, predominantly by themselves. The very large cluster bubbles tend to have around 10 or 12 people working together on average in that cluster. So there's quite a lot of patterns that are coming out in the way that we can divide this up. Uh, one of the things that doesn't show in this graph, because it wasn't something that actually went into the cluster analysis per se, so it wasn't one of the ways of dividing the clusters, but is the group is the victim agency. So one of the things that we do see is that for the clusters committing lower value frauds, where it tends to be less strongly male dominated in particular, these tend to be more likely to defraud welfare. Whereas the ones right up the top who are defrauding very, very large amounts of money and really large amounts of money for some of them are much more likely to be defrauding the tax office or customs. So briefly, the results then of study two, which was you know, finding that there are eight distinct subgroups, is that there, is, there really is significant um, diversity within Commonwealth fraud suspects. It's not enough to just say, here's what the average looks like, because there's a lot of variety of ways of committing fraud and types of people that commit fraud. So in this particular study from this sample, I ended up with eight statistically distinct subtypes. And as I said, we can see that men and women tend to be investigated for different kinds of fraud. Men, uh, when you've got people who are um, working in large groups, very much male-dominated groups with large amounts of money, um, that tends to come together in a way that's very, very different from the one solitary 
um, female dominated cluster. It also shows us that younger people are not excluded from serious fraud. That whilst our average person who commits fraud might be 42 years old and that that's consistent across the board, we've got clusters here who are committing fraud in their uh, late 20s all the way through to their 50s and 60s. So it's not necessarily that you need to be old enough to commit fraud. And it's one of those conceptions that generally speaking, it's not a young person's crime. It really can be if you're organized enough. One of the other things that this really brings about as well is, is that with white collar status, once again, that it's not actually a prerequisite for fraud. It does, however, help to facilitate an increase in the value of fraud that you're committing. So we saw that there were a couple of, of groups up the top who have mu like more than 50% of the people there are white collar um, occupant, have a white collar occupation. Whereas generally speaking, the rest of the groups are uh, less than a quarter of them have a white collar status. Yet they're still committing very, very high value crimes. So these particular groups, there's 16% of this group of young people, predominantly young males, committing tax fraud. Only 16% of them have a white collar job, but they're organized enough to work in large groups to do fake tax returns and do rather well for themselves at over $3 million on average. This group looks really, really similar. They're also working in large groups. They're also young. They're more likely to have uh, the occasional female involved, but they tend to defraud welfare. And the drip feed kind of arrangement that you can get out of welfare, even creating a lot of false identities, which is very common in that particular cluster, you're still limiting um, your ability to get the big bucks. So yes, the agency defrauded definitely helps to define the financial return from the fraud. Okay. Study three, and as I said, I'll try to just go through this one reasonably quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Okay, there's very limited research into what happens when you prosecute uh, a case of serious fraud. So what are the conviction likelihoods and what personal and case characteristics are more likely to lead to a conviction? So there wasn't a lot to draw on for this particular um, study. So instead I've tended to draw from the literature surrounding white collar crime in general, which even though I argue against it, is probably the closest place um, to draw from, and also um, studies of the perceptions of crime seriousness, assuming that um, if you perceive a crime to be more serious, you're more likely to record a conviction. Because that it doesn't necessarily equate when I say the likelihood of achieving a conviction, that's not necessarily the same as the likelihood of being acquitted or found guilty because you, there is always the option to not record a conviction. So the kinds of information that we know about what increases the likelihood of a conviction comes from a variety of sources. Um, there's some suggestion that the status of the victim, you know, fraud is often conceived of as a, a pretty much victimless crime, but that certain victims are more likely to be seen as, as a serious thing that you, or it's a crime that you should take more seriously. So uh, one author suggests that tax fraud is often considered to be less serious than welfare fraud, for instance. And he um, poses a, uh, a reverse Robin Hood system, basically, where taxpayers are the givers and the poor are the takers. So if you're taking and being and defrauding at the same time, then you're probably going to be viewed more negatively. Not unsurprisingly, there is a fair amount of evidence that indicates that if the value of the crime is very, very high, you're much more likely to be punished for that. And one of the ways, of course, of punishing is achieving a conviction. There's some suggestion, however, that if you have a white collar occupation, and this is rife throughout the white collar uh, crime literature, that there's a sense of it's a status shield. That because I, am, um, I have a, a prestigious background or I have a high occupational status, which tends to go with a much greater uh, sum of money, that I can negotiate my way through the criminal justice system a lot more efficiently than someone who's um, having to use um, legal aid for their welfare fraud claim. So there is some suggestion that white collar status might actually decrease your likelihood of being convicted. There are also arguments around gender, whether or not women are more likely to plead guilty, as was um, Jan Goldstraw's work um, found. 
but also that women tend to receive lower sentences when they are being sentenced than men are, although that's sort of conflated with the idea that women tend to defraud less. There's some argument that there's a protective effect of being very, very young or very, very old, which may actually have something to do with why we see um, the imprisoned population being much more middle-aged, but probably not. So these are some of the things that I tested. And I wanted to see if any of these factors actually applied for Commonwealth fraud. More variables this time. So they're very similar in a lot of ways. The things about the individual and the things about the case are very similar to the previous <coughs> studies. So again, I've looked at whether or not the value, uh, what the, the value of the crime was rather. Uh, not every crime, even finalised ones, had a value in there, so I did have to control for that. The agency that was defrauded, a couple of uh, factors, the impact and the priority which were assessed by the AFP when they do their categorisation of the case. How long the case had been going on for. So there's always an estimate this crime appears to have started two years ago and now it's completed. The gender mix, once again, of the suspects involved, the white collar status and the age of the suspects involved. And these final three variables are variables about the office because this whole uh, regression was conducted under a multi-level modelling process. So basically <coughs> we see that there are cases which are clustered um, or nested, if you will, inside the office that investigates them. And different offices have a different success rate. But different offices also get different kinds of cases referred to them and different offices have um, a different investigative capacity. So we've controlled for those factors. And um, what did turn out to be rather nice actually for the AFP is that once you control for the kinds of cases you're receiving, across the board there's no difference in your likelihood of, um, take, of accepting a case or your likelihood of um, taking a, a case to court or your likelihood of achieving a conviction. So that was rather reassuring. So briefly, the results were that and again, not surprisingly, if the dollar value is higher, if the impact is higher, and if the offence duration goes on for longer, these are the cases which are much more likely to achieve a conviction. Uh, one interesting factor, though, is if the suspects are in a mixed sex pair, so one male and one female working together. This has been suggested to me anecdotally that it may be that these are the people who you're more likely to be able to strike up a good plea bargain with. So you can uh, offer a conviction to one of your uh, suspects in order to have the other suspect have their charges dropped. Now one of the issues with the AFP data is that the conviction is attached to the case rather than to the individual. So that would actually still count as a conviction. And it would count as both of the individuals were involved in a case that was convicted. So it's just some of the things we have to deal with sometimes with data. It doesn't always work out the way you want it. Conviction is less likely, however, when it's a welfare fraud case, when you control for everything else. So one of the arguments around this is that it could be that if the crime is conceived of to be more need than greed, you might be less likely to be punitive. So there was no gender difference in conviction. There was this issue around couple um, bonds and there's no increased punitiveness for welfare fraud, but there's also no impact of white collar crime and no impact for age. So finally, what on earth does it all mean? So the key findings overall is that if you look outside of a white collar framework, if you just sort of stretch that sampling a little bit, you actually do see an awful lot of variability in fraud. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't be looking at particularly the high end white collar crime, but that you can't necessarily extrapolate that to talk about all fraud. One of the things that's really come through quite strongly in these studies is that age, sex and occupation all come together to influence who you choose as your victim. And therefore, that helps influence uh, what your financial reward can be. So that's within the framework, again, of opportunity structures. Who I am and who, who are, which agencies I have relationships with all blend together to know how much money I can make out of fraud. Women are much less likely to participate in the high value frauds. Um, gender, as I said, doesn't influence conviction, but those gendered bonds are something that you really can take advantage of, or perhaps people offer it up themselves. And finally, that white-collar occupation does not <coughs> offer any advantage in the cases of Commonwealth fraud. <coughs>
In terms of what the theoretical implications of this study is though, um, the key finding was that for women, if you'll pardon my mixed metaphor, there is both a level playing field and a glass ceiling, which sounds like a very uncomfortable place to play soccer. So you are, if you're female, you're much more likely to participate in Commonwealth fraud than in other frauds and certainly in other crimes. But there are limits to how far you can go with that. So one explanation that gets put forward for this gender gap that we see across crime in general is that there's a bigger gap between perceptions of myself as feminine and myself as criminal than there are for men perceiving themselves as masculine and perceiving themselves as criminal. So for women, it's actually a bigger stigma to take that step towards criminality. What I'd argue is that fraud's the kind of crime you can do without being a criminal. You know, it's much easier um, to do something which, for women, it's much easier to commit the kind of crime which is gender neutral and doesn't require um, you to basically push up against the boundaries of femininity in the same way that assault does. So there are arguments theoretically that fraud's the kind of crime that sort of shows more what kinds of crime criminality you might engage in if the gender boundaries weren't quite so strong. The second key finding is that fraud, and even really very, very serious fraud, can occur across an enormous range of socio-demographic backgrounds. So you don't need occupational prestige and you don't need age and maturity in order to make the money. We're much more likely to find the typical fraudster is a middle-aged, middle-class man when we decide that fraud is a white-collar crime because that's who we go out looking for. So this theoretical division between white-collar crime and street crime probably is a lot looser than a lot of theorists argue. And fraud, while it is a crime that's primarily claimed to be white-collar, I'd, find, I'd argue that there really is no empirical reason to say that that's the kind of crime that we're looking at. And that's all I have to offer for today, but I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.